my great honor to welcome back to the greatest little naval base in all the world, Mayport, to our 30th Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral John DeGrier, and the 13th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, Master Chief Petty Officer Stevens. Both of these are great warriors and war fighters. Each of them have commanded and led in every single possible level that represents the greatest part of our Navy traditions. Admiral Greener hails from Pennsylvania. Now he's a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Don't hold that against him. I have it. He's learned to learn, he's learned to love the Redskins too from all this time in Washington, D.C. And Master Stevens hails from Montana. So with that, it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome you back to Mayport. CNO, take on. Thank you. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's why you're in the Navy like me. <laughs> I got that. Thank you very much. Okay. What's your name, buddy? Sure. I am? Alright. You got family? Where are you from? New Orleans. New Orleans? Okay. I bring family up. Get your hands full here, huh? Three women? <laughs> you must be able to shave it out the door quickly, huh? Hey, girls. How you doing? You want to join? Yeah. Yeah, you don't put that in the slots. So that won't work. Yeah. Yeah, see you Which one? Destiny? Destiny. Okay. Where do you guys meet? Down the street? Right. So he can't be bragging about me and this, that, and the other thing. All right, nothing special. Let's go over there. You got that cheese down, don't you? Jump along. All right, thank you very much. Hi, right, Chief. Where are you from? Fort Worth. Fort Worth, Texas. You know that guy? You already know that? You didn't know that? Big city. Okay, you got family? Yes, I got Tornado. Tornado, that's your family, huh? Yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Just you and me, buddy. <laughs> Maybe afterward, if you guys are up for it, alright? Are we good? Alright. Nice to see you. Did I give you a clue? I did? Alright, good. I'm almost out of here. Which, uh, where are you from? Chicago? You got family? All right. How about that? I take a bus name. Jeremiah? Yeah. 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 Hello? I give you a point. All right, here we go. Hello, Jeremiah. Hi, buddy. Where are you from? Bolton House, right? Indianapolis? Yeah, family? Yeah. No, just you and I. Slum out with me. All right, you good? All good? Thank you. Where are you from, buddy? Ohio. Ohio? It's hard. Still a copy. Still a copy? Top of the big Buckeye fans. Bengals. Reds. How are you? Hi, man. How are you? Good. 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 What's your name? Sherry. Sherry? Where'd you get? High school sweethearts. High school sweethearts. Oh. Yeah, that's what you <laughs> All right. You guys feeling all right? Good for you. Thank you. Hello, miss. How are you doing? Where are you from? Lake Walls? Down by Orlando or something like that? Down by Orlando. Okay. Here, clear the ranks here. Okay, good. You got family here? Just you and me slumming it up. All right, you're stuck with me. All right, congratulations. Thank you. Hey, buddy, where are you from? No, it's another one. You got family here? All right. You plan on playing this, man? Is that right? Think about it for a while, huh? Okay, okay, okay. Emily, who's this? Yeah. Juliet? There you go. There you go. Tell us, Juliet. Five weeks. Where'd you guys be? Baton Rouge? What are you doing there? Art Walk? I don't know what that means. It sounds good. Hey, what's your name? Katie, where are you from? Pittsburgh, so what? Where are you from? Around the area? Washington County? Okay. 
Steve's right face. Fall out. Shutdown, 
and we got a good budget of 14. So we captured a lot of what we lost in 13, but we didn't capture all of it. So there's some carryover into this period of 15. Uh, as you may know, we have what's called a bipartisan budget act, which means that as in 14, we, we had numbers, we had a budget, and they passed it. And in 15, there are numbers, there's a budget, and it's likely they will pass it at that number. That's the number we submitted. But it's next year, it's 16, that's the critical year that we've got to watch out for. So what are our priorities? Number one for the Navy, it's this, what's called the sea based strategic return. It's what we have on the road piece. It's our Triton submarines, our pilot class, and the follow -up. That's the number one program that we have to deliver because, well, frankly, it depends the United States from, you know, it's our defense, our deterrence out there, and all that goes with it. The number two, it's about presence. So, get the slide up there. It's about being where it matters, when it matters around the world. Uh, whenever this airplane, the Malaysia Airline airplane went down, it was a P-3 that was in there right away. It was the USS Kidd and the Pinckney, which were right away just about out there and looking and searching while other folks were getting together and getting ready to go. Whenever the typhoon hit the Philippines last December, it was the George Washington and its host of uh, ships with the carrier striker, followed by amphibious ships that were there just a matter of a few days. It was Syria, it was Libya, it was Egypt, and it was North Korea, the defensive ballistic missile defense, that your people like you, you were, many of you may have been employed for all that, uh, and your brothers and sisters out there, being aware of that it matters. It's putting that presence together, delivering it out the world, organized, trained, equipped, ready, right capabilities, right weapon systems, right sensors. That's the bottom line of what we do. Everything feeds to that. And the amount of response after what we have out there present around the world is where we take kind of a surge up and down on our budgets. And we've got to be careful of that. And that's the message that we like to well, I'm spending a lot of time sending out to tell people, hey, you've got to be careful of what you're playing with. So we'll put together the best Navy we can that the people are willing to pay for and that our budget, that our, our country uh, is ready to put together and we're having that conversation with the Congress now. Okay, you take that down. There are, there are issues out there that we need to deal with and talk about, compensation reform. I assume you have a few questions on that. But I ask you to think about that and read beyond a few articles in some of the papers, the Navy Times, the Defense News, and some of that. Read into what is in compensation reform and what it really means. We have to answer questions. And understand that we've had a period of growth in our pay, in our BAAs. Uh, we haven't had any growth in TRICARE and our health care since the middle of the 90s, none for place or anything. And if we keep going at that matter, at that rate, excuse me, it's going to gobble up a lot of the budget. So we have to think about that. Is that what we want to do? So I think we're a little out of balance. I think that the amount of money we put in compensation is probably about right, and that's what a lot of you have told us. But the money that we have in places like where you work uh, is not right. We have too many gaps still. We have training to do, both professionally and personally, and unit. We need more spare parts. We need more time and sea to train. Our people need to get to the ones that we have, have to get to the ship sooner in the cycle. And we need more predictive, predictive, predictiveness in your schedule. And all of those get into a quality of work. So let me tell you that to balance this better, any, anything we get out of compensation reform and reduction of budget goes into those things I just rattled off. There, there's more topically, there's more work on projects and things of that nature. And some of it will be done in this area. So just try to think about in the balancing act, anything we get out of compensation reform is going to go into quality of work and quality of service. We can talk about more about that. But there's some tough choices ahead. I ask you to read about it, ask about it, look and see what we've got online, and, and then feed it back to us. So, you know, I got to admit that one of the reasons I came down here with you is to uh, talk with base leadership and see if I can't get a satellite office down here from, say, you know, October to March. Yes, I, mean, uh, I tried in San Diego last week and they turned me down. They said they had nothing available. I don't think that's true, but they yeah. turned me down. But see, you know, I really do look forward to uh, hearing from our sailors here in the fleet on what they're 
concerns are. Most, and just as importantly, some of the things that, that you may be doing really well here that you want us to take back so we can share it with others. So I'm ready to get started with this all hands call here on behalf of the center. Okay, so we're streaming online. So those of you out there in the internet land, we say hello and send in your questions if you got anything. So, so I guess I gotta say, for the record, I'm here to do the all hands call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, be careful. All right, uh, over to you all. And uh, come up to the mic if you can, otherwise we can repeat the question uh, if, you, uh, if we hear you otherwise. Great. Good afternoon. Why don't you just pull it out like karaoke style? <laughs> just turn there you turn go. No, big time. My name is Aiz Two Smith. I'm from Flea Readiness Center, Southeast of Tashman Bayport. My question is on the 2015 proposed budget. I know you just touched on it briefly regarding TRICARE. My question is regarding active duty whose family members are on TRICARE standard, what increases should we prepare for? Well, the uh, I don't know the specific numbers, but the kind of things would be a copay if you go outside of your TRICARE network or you don't use a medical treatment facility. So there'll be a copay associated if you go to a you know, doctor or whatever out there who is not you know, one of your TRICARE providers. Uh, there'll be uh, some increases in, uh, if you go to, uh, with, within the, the TRICARE network, I think it's like 10 bucks, I, I think, for a, for a visit as part of a copay. Uh, but it, it should be small and, and minimal like that. And I'd say pay close attention to that as, it, as we lay it out. And this should be on the website or type it in and ask the questions. Thank you, sir. Okay, where we go. Well, this could be a hard question. I need you to lean into the mic just a little bit. I'm a MAS Robinson with Dap State Security. Um, why, my question is why is her white points based on as a peer group and why is it not based on rank? And why did they remove the when making the rank the automatic group? I, I, I actually didn't hear your question. Can you pick the mic up and say we, we have a lot of, because of the mic, the way the speakers come at us, you could almost say it directly but easier than Michael, so please speak slow. Yes, sir. Why is the career waypoints based on a year group, and why don't we base it on a pay grade? And why did they remove making rate groups automatic, automatic approval, sir? The last part was why did they remove what? Automatic approval. Uh, making rate. Yeah, most most of them are automatic approval, but it really depends on the year group and the rating that you're in. Because if that rating is currently over banned, let's say over 100%, then it's going to require you to submit a request for approval to re-enlist because we have to make sure that we manage that. Otherwise, what will happen is it will be very difficult, if not impossible, for sailors in those year groups, groups and rates to advance. And so we've got to maintain a healthy source rate. So that's why they have the, the permission to re-enlist or to stay in. Uh, the first part of your question is what again? Why is it why is career waypoint based on a year group and not a rank? Yeah, once again, it's done so that we can ensure that we manage the health of those particular rates in that year group, so that we have the right turnover all the time. What will happen is if we don't manage it, uh, you see what happened a few years ago is those source ratings just kind of jam up, and then promotion opportunities just become very difficult. So it's just all about managing the source rate. I wish, you know, we always had this problem with sailors wanting to stay into the point where it becomes difficult. Uh, but we also, we have to manage that. It's just the number of sailors that are wanting to re-enlist and stay in the Navy right now, which is a good thing for us, but it becomes very difficult sometimes to manage it. Thank you, Big Bob. When we got rid of PTS, uh, we did want to form the serve. We didn't want to have to uh, have everybody apply. We wanted to have an automatic. And so when that's fine until you fill up, like the MCPON said, you get close to 100%, you have to start managing that a little bit. You should be getting uh, 
uh, really get 30 days or less, right, for responses, for reenlistment. Uh, as long as we can keep it at that, we can keep this wide open so we don't get into where we were before, which ended up in that, uh, that three-letter word, ERB. Yes, Tim, go ahead. Is all yeah, about the Navy. This is better. I'm I.T. Shaw uh, from ATG Mayport, and uh, the Navy is all about family, family, family. And I just wondered why we're lengthening deployments, which tends to separate families, and it's very hard to keep the family unit together on a certain time and months. Yes. Uh, well, we don't want to have a month deployments. We are at that right now because of what happened predominantly back in sequestration when we had a we had 13. We had uh, carriers and ships going into uh, maintenance, and uh, then we had to we had to slow down the budget. And they didn't get out of maintenance on time, which means they didn't get into their training phase. And the people who were already in the phase got on deployment, are on deployment, and standing to watch while these others are catching up. We should be done catching up, okay? Because we got a solid budget in 14. We get the maintenance done uh, by the end of this year. Uh, but until then, we have two of them out there now with that entire strike group to get it done. We're going to have George Bush, both of them. Truman's going to have nine and a half plus deployment. Bush is going to have a, a pretty lengthy deployment. I don't know the exact number, but it's close to this, the same amount. Following that, we should be returning back to what we want, which is we call it an optimized fleet response plan. And we're looking at what we feel is, is, is uh, something we can sustain at eight months. Uh, and that's the world that, that we live in. We are. Now this is carrier strike group, and this is uh, and the ships that support it be the same for amphibious ready group. The other units are the other communities are a little different. Subs are still six, six and a half, etc. Uh, cruiser destroyers not on BMD, the independent. There's somewhere between seven and eight. Uh, but we want to get that predictable. I think that's most important. Predictable and see what we can sustain predictably. But I I don't. Eight is uh, no greater than. That's that's what I think we can promise the National Command Authority. But we have, I, I still have to have that conversation to ensure that they don't start dialing that up slowly but surely, you know, and we can reach that. Uh, that's what we want to do. But it's going to see is uh, rugged duty. That's why we want to increase sea pay so that we can make it sea pay centric. That's why we want to make sure that they're fully manned. And we're working on a. Um, compensation pay uh, that, that will take care of those longer deployments, those greater than 190 days. Uh, I hope to have that out in about six months. CNP and I, Chief Naval Personnel, are, are working on the second average, supporting it, and now we've got to work to get that through. But we want to get the CPAY right off. Well, it's in place. It's, it should be distributed <coughs> shortly, and CPAY premium, both to support the need uh, to, to the need to, to compensate our folks in the city. Thank you, sir. Can, I, can I just add one thing? You said something that, that the babies don't run away from me. <laughs> you said that the Navy is uh, really is about families, and you're absolutely right. So aside from what the CMO talked about operationally at the CPA, you, I want you to know that leadership of the CNO, CMP, uh, and other senior leaders are fully committed to the resourcing and funding those programs to support our sailors and their families, such as child development centers and employment for spouses and counseling for children, school liaison programs, and the list goes on and on. Uh, we are committed to fund those to ensure that we mitigate to the best degree possible the stress that's placed on the families as a result of the deployments. I just wanted you to know that the leadership is committed. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. I'm RPSA Metcalf. I work at Helicopter Maritime Strike Week Clinic. And my question is, with the importance placed on maintaining physical fitness as a requirement to stay in the Navy, do you see in the future creating some type of recognition, such as an award or device to sustain for high scores of PFA? This question comes up quite frequently asked, actually, during some of my audience calls. You know, the way that I look at it and talk with leadership is that physical fitness isn't just about scoring an outstanding on the PFA. 
It's also about what you're doing for your shipmates or within your command. So if you score an outstanding on the, on the test, that's great, that's wonderful. But just as importantly, what are you doing to help your shipmates be successful? Because what we do is about team, right? And so we want to make sure that we don't, you know, recognize someone. Well, let me back up. We want to make sure that if we're recognizing someone, we're doing it for all the right reasons. That they themselves are in good physical condition, but also that they're supporting the command's physical fitness program. So you can score an excellent uh, on, a, on a test, but be a leader within the organization and not receive an award. You can score an outstanding, get an award, but you're kind of all about me, right? Not saying that if you get an outstanding, that you're always all about me. So we want to make sure that if we're going to give something or make that recommendation that we're doing for the right reasons. So that's something that we're, that we're discussing right now. Okay, does that make sense to you? I hope I confused myself a little bit. <laughs> you got <a> happy. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, sir, for fun. Uh, CG Comp 10 on 14. My question is, uh, with the direction that we're going in with reduced manning, reduced budget, or I say reduced, but just the new budget, the new manning that we have, smaller fleet size, we have shifted, I'd say, about the last 10 years away from the, uh, into an operator mentality for our technical rates. We're no longer troubleshooters. It's not as, as keen in our A schools and our C schools as we were as before. Uh, is there a plan in place to kind of refocus that for the technical rates, if not all rates? So when we get the new sailor out of the fleet, and I, you know, and I'm now on a nine-month cruise on a ship that's, you know, ten years past its dry dock time with less budget, less parts. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of working behind the curve on this. Is there a plan in place to, to increase that knowledge and get a better body with the yeah. reduced man? Okay, so I think there's a two-part answer. I'm going to give you half, and then I'll pick it up. Uh, we are not reducing the number of people per unit in the Navy today. It's actually, the Navy has been growing for two or three years. Uh, we are now almost at 324,000 in the Navy. And we'll stay there as long as we have the number of ships that we have. We'll bump up with the number of ships as they come in or go out. We man equipment. We buy the equipment and then we man. We have been undermanning our equipment for a number we're working to stop that, to, let me say, reconcile that. So we have 324,000 people in the Navy, and I think it's about right. They're not in the right place right now, and we're working on that. That becomes the issue. I won't reduce standing due to sequestration, due to lower budgets, just for the sake of reducing standing. We, if we retire units, okay, those, those records are coming with people in the mind. So uh, what, is, what are we doing about it? Well, as you have read, you read the Times today and other things, we're moving people towards sea to, to do that. And we're also, we have a cruiser plan, if you will, cruiser modernization plan in place. When those cruisers get inducted to prepare to go in for modernization, we start reducing the manning while they're away from modernization. Those people will go back in the fleet and go to shore sites for maintenance. We're increasing the number of folks at our regional maintenance centers. We've continued to do that. And you got to have the right kind of skill set. You can't just send Billy and Tommy over there. Take one over there and work. you got to have the right skills, so that will take time. But we do have a deliberate effort in place. We'll keep on it. I give you my word on that. And you should see this slowly growing. Uh, I would hope you'll see your Optar budget and, and other things that you need to do the work and see going up in this fiscal year 14 budget. A heck of a lot different from the 13 budget at the end of the 12 budget. Uh, as far as feeding you sailors, you know, that are better trained, I was going to talk about that. So when I'm talking to a master chief that has, you know, 29, 30 years, and one of the things I always say to me is, man, I'll tell you, the chiefs are just getting younger, right? And I tell them, I say, no, master chief, you're just getting old, right? Chiefs are the same age as they've always been. Same thing, you and I have to be careful when we're talking about sailors that are coming in from these schools. Because the more experience that we have, the more time in the fleet, it seems the less the sailors know. Right? So it's all, I think it's, it's in the eye of the beholder. Because I've been to these eight schools, I've seen what these sailors are learning and the type of instruction that they're going through. And for the most part, it's remained constant over the last 15 years. It's 
because if anything, it's probably gotten a little bit better in the schools that I visited. Remember that when we send them to A school, we're just teaching them the basic fundamentals, and then it's their complete experience that makes them better, and then it's the C schools that make them technical experts. So we just have to be careful on how we view that, uh, because I will tell you that the folks that are out there at our A and C schools are doing wonderful work, and you and I just need to make sure that we recognize that and then do our job as chief petty officers and provide that over-the-shoulder training to help them become that much better, just like someone did for you and I. I don't, I'm not saying that what you're seeing uh, is a reality for you, but as I look across the entire Navy, uh, I see that our sailors are coming into the fleet are, are very good and very sound with the basic fundamentals and that we just have to teach them the rest. So we just gotta make sure that we don't allow our perception uh, to, to, you know, be, to weigh too heavy on something like that, okay? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Ben Kwan. Um, I'm Agent 3 Black, I'm from Cap Force C South East Dead Network. Sir, I would like to ask for your take on the proposed change to tuition assistance about the military who apply for TA may have to cover 25% and the government will cover the other 75%. Sir, what is your take on that? Well, uh, I'm the guy that signs the budget, so that one in. Uh, I'm going to Good afternoon, sir. My name is Edwin Martin from the Southeast Region Maintenance Center. Sir, my question today is regarding the retirement plan that they put in place. Is it going to be grandfathered for the current sailors that are already in the room? Yeah, any, any retirement that would change that would take place, which by the way is down the road, would be grandfathered. Uh, I got to tell you that there's been some kind of word on the street in some papers that there, the DOD put together a retirement plan for consideration. That, there's no retirement plan. Anybody put what the DOD did do is there's a commission out there who is working on uh, some recommendations for the Congress. The Congress asked them to do that. And they're made up of retired businessmen, retired civic leaders, some, a congressperson, uh, general, and that. And so they're looking at all kinds of things. 
pay to, to and including retirement. They won't report to the Congress until a year from now, and then the Congress will think about it and look at it. The Department of Defense provided some input to them to say, you know, when you think about this, here's some things you ought to consider. A 401k kind of thing. Remember the, the leadership skills people develop in the military, all kind of different things. That got confused to see that there was a plan put together. It's not true. So the bottom line is, it's, it's quite a ways away, I think, before we see any new retirement plan. But your question is, well, what about the one I have? That's yours. Anybody that's out here in uniform or the sound of my voice, if they're wearing a uniform, they're on the retirement plan that is their retirement plan. And anything that comes in will be grandfathered. The one thing they may offer is an option to go to the new one, if, if, depending on where you are in your career. Thanks, sir. Good afternoon, sir. My name is uh, A.B. Sudagazan from Naval Station, uh, Naval Station Naval Board Air Operations. My question is, David Sounds has reported major changes in military pay like boring VAH. Will we see more base housing being built to accommodate those sailors? Will no longer be able to afford off base housing? And will there be more single sailors housing built to accommodate P5s and E6 who would prefer to live, to live on base? Well, um, I'll let you comment on that. No way's VAH is going down. But VAH has been going up at a certain rate over the, the years. And so the proposal, the proposal is to limit that growth. So there's no going down. So that's kind of one. It's, it's a limit of the growth. Uh, number two, a person's got a lease in hand, and they're on orders. Uh, even if this change is accepted, their VAH won't change until make PCS somewhere else and go to get a new lease. See what I'm saying? So, and then there'll be maybe some different rates. They'll have risen with the, with the, uh, uh, the area, if you will, but not at the current rate that they've been going up five, six, seven percent. That makes, that understand what I'm saying? There's a, there's a feeling that, okay, the DAH check I have is going down. That's just not right. And if you have a lease or a mortgage right now in the area, that's not going to change until you change, until you change duty stage. Uh, so now building more housing, you know, frankly, today we have more housing than we have people in the housing right now. Uh, so if we build more, we would exacerbate what is currently a problem of occupancy because people are living in their own homes right now. They're not getting involved in as much of the PPD that we have out there or, or otherwise, and based on that. Yeah, I just say so don't panic. The, the slope of growth in VAH is not going to cause a flood of E5s and E6s to come on the base looking for a, a place to lay their head. There's no plans to build barracks and store E5s and E6s. We're working really hard to get the home port, the, the, the shore, to the sea to shore, home port to shore, we call it, uh, for our E4 under 4. Uh, right now, we still got about 4,000 sailors that we're trying to get off the ships and into those barracks. So, we're just not going to build them under E5s and E6s. Because your BAH is E5 and E6 will certainly cover the cost of living out of the town. So I wouldn't panic. You're going to, you're going to receive adequate housing allowance to live out of town. Thanks, sir. Good afternoon, then. Admiral. A2 Garza. I'm uh, on I-8 orders in the reserves. And, uh, I had the pleasure of being on the West back in 2010 when I was in the range. And uh, more recently, I'm going to be advising the Secretary of the Navy to the group of the enterprise. And my question is based around this recent. Well, the secretary is very good people. 
are his number one. And because we've gone through time, budgets go up, budgets go down, and you can turn on the money, reconstitute. If you have the industrial base, you got a shipyard, you can build ships, you got the depot, you can build airplanes. We've grown Jacksonville reasonably fast. We have a new class of, uh, a new type of series of airplanes, et cetera. You get the people issue wrong, then you know you got the wrong number, you got the wrong skill set, they're demotivated, you're not educating them. It takes a generation to find us about 10 years. And we've done that wrong before. We did it wrong in the 90s. We did it wrong after the Vietnam War. Back in that time, we called ourselves Apollo. What we meant by that is we had a drug problem, a morale problem, we didn't want people, we had totally the wrong skill set. And you can do just about anything else after that. Thank you again for your service.
they're going to the George Washington this year, 2014. So they'd be able to apply for overseas housing allowance. And what did you say after that? After 2000. After 2015? Uh, I can't understand why they wouldn't. If they're, they're going to come back to the United States with the ship, uh, that's another matter. But a lot of the crews stay there. We do that specifically. We like to keep a lot of the crew there. They're embedded. We just screen them to the young lady's previous question. You know, we go through a lot of, uh, a lot of effort to screen people who are going overseas because it's a special bill. So we like to keep, uh, there's a ratio, we like to do two thirds, one third. It varies by platform. Does that make sense to you? Uh, and and we, we do that. So it would seem to me uh, it is likely to answer your question is yes, but it's case by case. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Ed. DC One Company for USS Ever. Uh, my question is with uh, the housing market, with the housing crisis, uh, many military members face uh, short sales and foreclosures. Uh, there were some programs that were in place to help the service members with that, yeah. uh, such as like the capital gains tax relief, uh, which ended in December 2013. Are there plans to bring that back in 2014, sir? I don't know. Uh, that was a federal program, as I recall. Uh, yes, sir. So I'd have to ask that question. Uh, if you're doing the taxes now. Well, no, sir, I'm working on short sale to do a relocation. Okay. Uh, I mean, you might want to ask the IRS because they're the ones that kind of put it in. Good afternoon, I'm Roland McBond. Um, my name is Tim Kiernan. I was just asking what is the sanctions with the Russia, with the Korean crisis, done deal with the Navy, how that's going to affect us? I don't think it will affect you in the near term. Uh, here's what I mean by that. It's been a decision of the nation to deal with this through diplomatic interagency, use NATO as appropriate the United Nations rather than just specifically one-on-one, -on -one. particularly when it comes to the military, uh, well, military, let's just say that. Uh, we spent some time making sure we, we reassure our allies. Uh, the Truxton continued on a, a port visit that she had in Romania. Are you familiar with the Black Sea? Okay, so you know, Romania's on the left-hand side of the Black Sea like this, and then you got Bulgaria south of her, and then you got Turkey, and then you go through down to the Mediterranean. So, you know, our, our friends and allies, Poland and others, we reassured them, hey, we're here for you. You know, this is not falling apart uh, as we work through this long, complicated thing. We provide uh, options, as I was talking to you before. We've got ships in the Mediterranean. We've got the George River Walker Bush strike group in the Mediterranean. The nation's got options. But the issues today are not military right now. There are, there are other issues that the president is using, other means of president.
because the country is at war right now. And that, that was waived in 2001. We in the Navy say, look, our folks are still standing and watch and will be standing and watch and are spending a lot of time on deployment. We would like to, to reimburse them for that, not just the career sea pay, but for the deployment allowance. So we're working on that. I hope to get that going in the next number of months. Thank you very much. It's not 
that hasn't just mitigated sexual assault, it's mitigated a lot of other things. For, you know, sailors uh, potentially getting into the trouble that they shouldn't be getting into. So I heard from leadership initially, you know, especially with my chief's message, I talked to them, there was a concern that this is going to be an added burden, there might not be any benefit to it, etc. But as I went back and talked to those chiefs, those commanding officers, those exos, what, what they have told me is that, hey, it's making a difference. Uh, and so I would say the answer to your question without directly looking at the stats based on feedback is yes. We have we do have statistics in some areas. San Diego, uh, certainly the Great Lakes, where we instituted this, the blue on blue number of crimes in general went down. Uh, we got feedback in San Diego from residents that said, hey, we feel much more safe here. And this is male female uh, here. Uh, we, we found all kind of funny things going on uh, in, in some of the barracks that were some illegal noise on that we were able to kind of flesh out and get out of the way. Uh, half, half of the sexual assaults that take place in our Navy are on a ship or on a base. The other half are off the base. So we, we want to influence that. So we just can't. I mean, it doesn't impact that. That has to be dealt with otherwise. I'll leave you with this. We just finished a survey, and many of you hopefully filled it out and were a part of that survey. Some of the data that's come in shows this. People say uh, there's no more prevalence of sexual assault, percentage-wise, than there was, say, last year or the year before. But the numbers of reports are going up, which means people are much more uh, likely to come forward and report it. And the age of the event is, is becoming uh, seemingly greater and greater in the increase. In other words, it's 30 days, not three days, maybe a year that, that something took place. And there's a lot more people reporting uh, grabbing, groping, contact, if you will, rather than what they call penetration crime. So we're starting to get much smarter in the law, and people are indicating directly, they're directly telling us, I'm more likely to come and tell you that something happens, and I'm more likely to. But yeah, I'll make it. Good afternoon. I Kim Bueller and Audrey from the USS Tornado. My question is with the ongoing possibility of uh, long deployment, will the sea to shore ratio uh, change for sea guard rates like quartermaster? Uh, with the longer deployments, yeah, yeah maybe. Uh, will the sea to shore ratio change for sea going rates? Uh, I don't see that right now. No. We don't want to, we're not ready to do that yet because that's that's a balance that has to take place. If you increase sea time, okay, that's good, but what about shore? Who's not, you know, those sumps not get to go ashore. A gentleman came up earlier when they increased maintenance uh, uh, on the ships. We gotta send people ashore to get their skills home, so we gotta watch that balance. Right now, we don't have an answer ashore to by moving more people to seek a long period of time. I see what I mean. Thank you. Adam Brady, we have about five minutes on here. Five? Okay. Uh, somebody else can start and put it out and see if there's another question. Does anybody have another question? Somebody in the back there? So remember until the Chief of Naval Personnel signs it, right, it's not something that's actually going to happen. I will tell you that we've been reviewing this for several months now, I think almost near, nearly a year now we've been looking at it. I actually had the opportunity the other day uh, to look at the, pr the proposal, but I know that the CMP looked at it and he had some more questions. Because we want to make sure that if we're doing something, we're not doing it just to be doing it. Right, that there's actually actual reasons for doing it and that those reasons benefit our sailors. So there's a, there's a possibility sometime in the near future you'll see something come out. But until it's signed, 
It's just, it's just speculation. And it may never get signed, who knows? They may look at it and, and, and weigh it and say, you know, at the end of the day, there's really no reason to do it. Uh, or he may decide to sign it out. We'll have to wait and see. I have one thing you're talking about advancement. Well, I sure hope that I'm not right because I'm not going to get drilled. But I heard that the the uh, results for the E7 exam were on the board elevators. Is that true? Yeah. Correct. Okay, yeah. so now I'm glad I got that right. But, uh, so uh, for those that are more eligible, I wish you all the best as you continue on your journey uh, in the Navy to, to hopefully be one day to the Chief Governor. You know, you had a question? Uh, yes, sir. I was wondering uh, what would cause an increase in the ability in uh, cross rank? Would that be like an underband issue or would that be a better issue? Yeah, pro cross rating from one rate to another. Yeah, that's that's all about the rate you're in and what the man level of that is and how critical that skill set is and the rate that you're wanting to go to, the availability for that rate to be open. And so it really varies from you know, one rate to the next. So without knowing more specifics, I couldn't answer your, your question. It really is, is if you're going from one rate to another, there has to be uh, an open slot that you're going to and the rate that you're leaving has to be manned in such that they can afford to let you go and you have to be qualified to go into that meeting. Okay. Any closing? So, uh, all right. So, um, good afternoon, this is Mick Hunt. And um, so, um, my question is actually regarding, um, regarding the ships inside the main port. Are we going to be expecting any um, carrier base? Carriers come this way in the past and in the future. I know it's something that's going on in the past that really never got wrapped up to shipping. Yeah. Well, we we would like to be able to have uh, two ports on each coast for every type of ship. So that would be for submarine, for destroyer, for cruiser, for amphibious ship, for carrier. We have that on the west coast, every type. We have it on the east coast as soon as Iwo Jima and Fort McHenry gets down here. We'll have it for every kind on the East Coast except for carrier. So we want to get there, but we don't have any extra money to, to build to bring a carrier down here. You got to build a carrier maintenance facility. If you don't do that, then you got to send all these people down here to do the maintenance, or you got to send a carrier up north. That wouldn't work out. It would be, it would be very disruptive. So until we get that that kind of money, it's about a half a billion dollars. It's less. It's a little less than that. Nonetheless, we just don't have that right now. But when Iwo Jima gets here, you see her on the skyline. That's a pretty big ship. It, it isn't a carrier, but it kind of looks like one when you look at it. So you'll have some big ships in this harbor come later this year. So we're looking, we're looking toward it. I'd like to get there someday. I, I just, we just don't have the money right now. Okay, but we, we, when, we, when getting that amphibious ready group down here does give us that balance so I sense that there's a little anxiety mixed with a little bit of curiosity about some of these proposals that were made forth with regards to paying compensation as it ties to our budget. I'll share with you what I talked to Congress about when I testified about three weeks ago. What I said to them was, one of the greatest weapon systems that the Navy owns is called unit morale. Unit morale in and by itself is a weapon system. And leadership, we recognize just how important it is. So we're working very, very hard to ensure that the programs, the funding, and everything that you need to be able to continue to operate at the highest level of morale is in place and serving its intended purpose. So certainly you have all the right in the world to be a little concerned and to be thinking about it. But I think it's fair to say that when it's all said and done, you're going to be well taken care of and your families are going to be well supported because leadership will fight the good fight to make sure that, that that is in place for all of you. I just wanted to share that with you and also thank you very much for your time today. And I wish you all the best and you and your families. Thanks. So uh, Mayport will be a part of our future, which is far in the future as I can see. So
some people say, gee whiz, uh, are we going to bracket this place in base realignment and closure? I don't see that. Uh, well, what about cruisers? You know, there's this cruiser plant. When they leave here, they might have to go be modernized. They will be backfilled with DDGs eventually, telecommunicates, as we try to keep a balance on the East Coast. This remains a literal combat ship port, and they will come uh, in accordance with our plan. Are we going to stop building literal combat ships? No. The plan is, the Secretary of Defense said, OK, Navy, I want you to go ahead and continue building 32 literal combat ships, because we need small service combatants, and he knows that. And he said, before you go to 33, I want you to come back and talk to me, SecDev, and I want you to show me that it's going to be more literal combat ships, and show me the lethality, the survivability, the maintenance, of that class of ship as it currently is, or give me an alternative that, like, you know, in Arlie Bird, this word, we got different flights. On Hornets, we got different flights, if you will, different type classes, if you will. We might be looking at another flight of World Combat ship. It may look strangely the same, but it might be somewhat different. So that's number two and three. Say, show me a, a completely new ship. Show me a new frigate like ship. And what that might cost, and when can we start building it? By the way, folks, it takes a long time to design a ship from scratch. The fastest we've ever done it is 10 years. And that's the little combat ship. And some people said, you did it too fast. So there will be more small surface combats. It's just a matter of, we need 20 more. We need 52 total, 32 plus the additional 20. It's a matter of how we'll put this together. And that's what we're working on. Like the Mick Pond said, I can understand your anxiety. But also like the Mick Pond said, we're, we know that you are our asymmetric advantage. That's our people that make the difference and makes our Navy the best Navy in the world. For those of you families who came today, thanks a lot. Thanks for taking care of your sailor. Thanks for hanging out with me, getting the picture taken with Arlene and I do that. Really get charged up. Boy, does it bring back memories. My kids usually throw it off on my jacket. It's really great. But none of that happens. So I, for those of you civilians I see out there, Sim Burbs, you're our ship base. And uh, you make this base run. I saw some coming in here. I recognize from the other gym. Uh, and you're our ship base. And I thank you very much. And I, I feel very, very bad. I have for a long time about what happened in the 13th when we had furloughs and we had hiring freezes and all that. And I'll tell you, we'll do everything we can to not do that again. And I know Secretary Davis feels very strongly about that. We all do. So you're our partner. You're with us. With us, and we're not going to get any further back here. So take care of each other. Keep your keep your uh, your psyches together. If somebody's acting a little funny, talk to them. Okay, our suicides are on and down now, but I can't tell you exactly why. We need to be resilient. Uh, so we'll go to work. We'll back up and forth. We got your input. Uh, buckle down and see what we can do. Enjoy your weather. All right. Thank you very much for having us here.